Now, as we do countdown to resurrection, this is our Bible study, countdown to resurrection, as we come up to Easter, the last Sunday of this month, the last day of this month, today we're going to study the triumphal entry. Well, today we're going to study Palm Sunday. Well, which one is it? I've had several of you ask me, okay, now I need you to tell me what is Palm Sunday and tell me what is the triumphal entry. And when did each one of them happen? Well, it's the same exact day. It's exactly the same thing. It is amazing. This is a mind-blowing Bible study today. Okay, church. The resurrection is a big deal. The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is a big deal. When God comes down from heaven and dies on a cross to save us from our sins, when God dies, it is a big deal. When he resurrects from the grave after three days, it is a big deal. It is a lot larger, bigger deal than we ever dreamed. It affects the whole earth. It affects and saves the universe, the kingdom of God. It saves each one of us individually but it also saves the kingdom that God has created for us. The universe was created for us. I don't know what we're going to get to do in the universe, but it's going to be a big deal. I can't wait. Okay, now, how is this going to fit together? Because Palm Sunday is when everybody shows the picture of the, the Lamb of God dying on the cross. The Lamb of God dies. And we've got the palms that we're all waving. And yet, and yet, Jesus rides on a donkey coming in Jerusalem as king. So is he the lamb that's slain before the foundation of the world to save the, the world from their sins and everybody's sin? Or is it when he's coming as king, riding on a donkey? Which one is it and how do these fit together? And it is a big deal. Okay, this is cool. All right. We're going to look at Jerusalem first. As we look at Jerusalem, we're going to see the temple up there. So we've got this picture of the temple. We're focused on the temple mount in Jerusalem, and this is old Jerusalem, and there is the Dome of the Rock sitting on the temple mount. By the way, this is going to change shortly. But there it is. But as our vision expands... We don't just focus on the Temple Mount, but look, look what we see. There's more and more and more. Now, we're going to look at two things to start off with in the Old Testament. God's got two pictures that He's going to show us about the triumphal entry in the Old Testament. The first one is going to be fairly small as we focus on Christ, as we focus on the Lamb of God. But then the second one in Joshua is going to expand our image. So have you ever looked at a set of blueprints? How many of you have ever seen a set of blueprints? Okay, the first page of the blueprints is what the, the house or the business, the building is going to look like. We call it the elevation. You look at it and it shows the building and what the building looks like. What your house is going to look like. And that's cool because everybody wants to see what their house is going to look like. But when you turn the next page, you're going to see all the electrical, all that detailed electrical stuff that drives people crazy. And then when you turn the next page, it gets even worse. Now you're going to look at the plumbing, which really drives people crazy. So what is the house made of? Is the house the electrical? Is the house the plumbing? Or is the house the building? Yes. Yes. So we're going to look at the triumphal entry today. And is it going to be Palm Sunday? Or is it going to be the triumphal entry? Is it going to be the lamb slain before the foundation of the world? The lamb slain for our sins and the forgiveness of our sins? Or is it going to be the king riding on a donkey? Yes, all of it together as you, as you put all this together. So we're going to look at, first we're going to take a look at this temple mount, this little picture of this temple mount. And then God, as we look at Joshua, God is going to expand that out 
to where we see all the whole picture, and it gets really fun. So we've got three points this morning. Number one, point number one, the physical picture of the Lamb of God. Okay, the physical picture of the Lamb of God. We're going to look in Exodus chapter 12. We'll have it up on the screen. Exodus chapter 12, 1 through 7. Now the Lord spoke to Moses. And you're going to see what this has to do with Jesus' triumphal entry, with Jesus' Palm Sunday. We're going to get to that. But it starts all the way back in the book of Exodus, chapter 12. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months, the first month. Shall be the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month. Now listen, this is going to be the key to this Bible study. On the first month, on the tenth day of the month, on the tenth day of the first month, this is going to be the key to what we're looking at. On the tenth day of the first month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons, according to each man's need you shall make your count for the lamb your lamb shall be without blemish your lamb shall be without blemish your lamb shall be perfect a male of the first year you may take from the sheep or the goats now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month now this is important you're going to keep it till the 14th day of the same month you're going to start off on what day the 10th, and you're going to keep it till the 14th. So then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. And the Hebrew word is, the Hebrew words are between the twilights. And the rabbis pictured that in their Torah law as 3 p.m. Interesting. All right, now watch this. You shall keep it till the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. This is the picture of Christ. Now, what it says is this. I, we want you to take a, a baby lamb, and we want you to set it aside and keep it in your house, and we want you to put it with the kids, and we want you to feed it every day, and we want you to keep it till the 14th day of the month. Now, hold your hand up here. Just one hand. Just one hand, because we're going to use the other hand to count with. 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th. So five days before the Passover, five days before you kill it. That's 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. And on the 14th day at evening at 3 o'clock, you're going to kill the lamb. This is exactly what happened with Jesus. Now, what it says is we want you to watch it and make sure it's without blemish for five days we want you to watch it for five days and make sure it's without blemish and then on the three o'clock on the 14th we want you to kill this lamb that's exactly what happened to jesus now hold that thought for just a minute what time did he die on the cross the bible tells you exactly what time he died on the cross three o'clock so as in the temple as they're cutting the throat for this lamb to kill it for the Passover, they blow a trumpet at 3 o'clock on the temple itself. The shofar. And as they blow the shofar all across Jerusalem, everybody knows that it's 3 o'clock and they're killing the lamb in the temple. Jesus is hanging on the cross, and at 3 o'clock when he hears the trumpet blow, he cries out, it's finished and he gave up the spirit and he died at three o'clock at the same time they're killing the passover lamb in there this is the picture of christ dying for our sins and the sins of the whole world got the picture that's point number one <clears throat> point number two is found in joshua chapter four this gets wild now God's going to expand this picture. Now he's going to talk about the invisible spiritual results of the leader of God. 
Now, point number one is the salvation of God. Point number two is going to be the kingdom of God. Now, watch this, because this is going to be the key on the tenth day of the first month. So, in Joshua chapter 4, verse 19, as Israel is about to go into the promised land. Now, in Egypt, I'm sorry, in Exodus, they're leaving Egypt. It's Passover night. It's the Exodus. It's the day, the night of the Exodus as they leave Egypt. When do they leave Egypt? You got the date. Now, Joshua, they're going to come into the promised land. So they've left Egypt, and now they're going to come into the promised land. Now, the people came up from the Jordan on the 10th day of the what? The first month. This is the key. And they camped in Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. Put the other verses up there for me, please. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is crossing over before you into the Jordan. And as those who bore the ark came to the Jordan, and the feet of the priests who bore the ark dipped into the edge of the water, for the Jordan overflows all its banks at this time of springtime, during the whole time of harvest, but that the waters that came down from upstream stood still. So this is the Jordan River running down through there. And when the priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant, there's four priests, there's a rod on this side and a rod on this side of the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant is the throne that Jesus sits on. Remember the cloud out in the wilderness? Remember the pillar of fire out in the wilderness? It said it always sat on the temple. Well, it was sitting in the Holy of Holies on top of this Ark of the Covenant. It's the throne of God. Now, when the priests here and here and here and here are carrying this Ark of the Covenant and they step into the Jordan River, what do the waters do in the Jordan River? They stop, they part, and up, up the north, it just builds up. Well, now, when you've got a river that builds up, it's going to cover the whole land. Now, watch this. This is cool. I learned so much in this Bible study, and you're going to too if I can preach it right. Could I have an amen? <laughs> yeah, okay. The waters which came down from upstream stood still and rose up in a heap very far away at what town? At Adam or Adam, at Adam. And the city that's beside Zaratan. Zaratan, Zaratan is beside Adam. You know what Zaratan means in Hebrew? what the word means the flesh you know what the word adam adam means man these waters are going to be cut off and they're going to roll up they're going to build up where god cuts them off and where does god cut them off up at adam and zaratan where does god cut the waters off there's an obstacle that you can't get into the promised land the the jordan river is flooding and they can't get across at this time of year. And so God's going to cut it off, and he's going to cut it off up where? At where? Adam and Zaratan. At mankind and the flesh. God's going to cut off up there and just cover up mankind and the flesh so that the Israelites can walk into the promised land on dry ground. This is a big deal. This is an important deal that we're going to look at. And what day did it happen? On the tenth day of the... So we're going to connect that to the lamb, the death of the lamb over here on the 10th day of the first month. So God's going to focus on this because what's really important is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for all of mankind. But as he focuses on that, as we look at Joshua, he's going to spread the picture out and give us the, a bigger picture. That doesn't change this little picture. It's just going to give you a bigger picture. That doesn't change the blueprints of the house. It's just going to show you what's on the inside of that house also. So if you live in a house without electrical, and you live in a house without plumbing, what are you living in? A shell. We would say a shack. My grandkids went down to Paladero Canyon last night, and they stayed in a cabin. It's a beautiful cabin, really nice cabin, that you have to rent months in advance but when you get into the cabin it has no 
plumbing. So if you want to go to the bathroom, you have to walk out and walk. And it was cold. And the wind was blowing 30 miles an hour. And it was 24 degrees. And you got to walk about six blocks up to the bathroom. That's not a house. That's a cabin. That's not a house. That's a shack. What's important about that house is it's got some electrical and it's got some plumbing in it. It's got heating and air conditioning in it, and that's what makes it a house. Now, we're looking at this little picture of the salvation of Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection. But point number two, we're going to look at the spiritual and visible results of that. And what we're looking at is salvation plus kingdom. Okay, now, Israel is going to walk across the Jordan River, and where are they going to walk into? Where are they going to walk into? This is not a hard question. The what? They're going to walk into the promised land. Okay, as they walk into the promised land in Joshua, several things are going to happen. Let's see, did we do 15 through 17? Okay, as they walk into the promised land, the first thing that God tells them, the first thing that God tells the, the Israelites, as they're already, they walked in as an army, following Joshua, the leader. You know what the Greek name of Joshua is? Jesus. You know what the Hebrew name for Jesus is? Joshua. This is a picture of Jesus Christ leading the church of God across this obstacle that he's dried up. What's the obstacle? For the church, our flesh, our humanity. And here's what God says. I want you to walk in the spirit and not in the... I want you to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. And this is going to be a picture of how the church has revival. This, as Jesus goes into... And we're going to look at this if we, if we hurry. If you listen quickly. What we're going to look at is Jesus in the triumphal entry going into Jerusalem. But the picture is unbelievably magnificent. It's not just Jesus going in there. It's Jesus leading us in there. Okay, point number two is a, is a picture of the kingdom of God in salvation. Now God's going to take, Joshua's going to take, Jesus is going to take, and walk across the Jordan River that God's cut off. The obstacle to getting into the promised land of living in, Christians living in the promised land. Hold that thought. Over here in Exodus, way over here in Exodus, as they leave Egypt, what takes place that night is the death of the lamb. And they take the blood and they put it on the two side posts of the door and then they put it up at the top on the lintel. They kill the lamb at the door. Well, lambs don't like to be killed. So they're wiggling and moving around, and as they cut the throat of the lamb, they're catching the blood in a basin, but, but lambs don't just stand there and let you kill them. They wiggle all over the place, and it gets blood all over the doorpost, I mean all over the floor, as you catch it in the basin. And then you, you dip it, the blood's in the basin, put it on the lintel and the lintel, and, I'm sorry, doorpost, doorpost, and lintel up there. That is the picture of the cross. Up at the top is the blood of Christ's head, on the sides of the blood of Christ's hands and down at the bottom is the blood of Christ's feet. It is the cross of Jesus Christ. And you put it on your doorpost so that when the death angel walks by there, you are saved. Got the picture. That's what happened in Egypt. Now, that same group that's going to leave in salvation, it's a picture of them being saved, is going to come into the promised land. And this is a bunch of saved people, if you will. The picture is a bunch of saved people, the church, coming into the promised land. But to get into the promised land of power, to get into the kingdom of God, you've got this obstacle. Is the obstacle of our flesh, is the obstacle of our humanity that just keeps getting in the way. Lord, I can do this myself. God puts the, the 12 apostles in a boat out there in the middle of the storm, and let them row for six hours. And they went nowhere. And then he comes walking on the water and he walks right up to them. And he gets in the boat. And they're there. 
What do you think he's teaching them? Well, Lord, we can do this ourselves, but it didn't work. So what's he teaching them? Well, if you'd have called on me a little earlier, we could have been there a lot earlier. He's going to teach them that if we let God do it through us, we have power. Let's see, Jesus said it this way. Without me, you can do, but I can do all things through Christ. And so as they enter into this promised land, the obstacle of our power, the obstacle of taking over Jericho is this river that's flooded and it's our flesh, it's the old man, it's our humanity, and we're walking in that, and that keeps us from the power of God. And so God's going to teach us something about that. So in point number two, we're going to talk about the kingdom of God as they come in here. So we're going to overcome the flesh, and then the next thing that takes place is God tells the army as they get ready to attack Jericho, he said, wait, 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 wait. I want you to circumcise yourselves, army. I want you to take the army of God that's going to defend all these people. I want you to circumcise yourself. That's going to slow the army of God down. What's God teaching them? Well, here's what he says. Here's what it says in Joshua. I want you to purify yourselves. I want you to consecrate yourself. Now listen, because when we get to the... When we get to Jesus in a minute, you're going to see this again. I want you to consecrate yourselves. I want you to purify yourselves because you weren't doing this. And I want you to go ahead and do this like you were supposed to to begin with. And so, for five days, that army's just stuck right there. And then you know what happens the next day in the story of Joshua? You know what happens the next day? They celebrated the Passover. Now, what had they celebrated when they left Egypt? The Passover. Now, as they enter into the Promised Land, what are they going to celebrate? The Passover. What happens on the Passover? The death, the burial, and the resurrection of... And he's going to teach them some things about consecrating yourself. And then the next thing they're going to celebrate, there is going to be the Passover. So is the church going to have to die? Like Jesus died? Well, here's what it says. I am crucified. What happened at the Passover? What happened at Passover in Jesus' day? What day did Jesus die on? Passover day at 3 o'clock. Are you going to have to do that? I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life I live in the flesh, I live by the, I live by the faith. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So God's going to talk about being a living sacrifice. Remember when Abraham took Isaac up on the hill and he's going to kill Isaac? He's got the wood on his back. It's a picture of the cross. And just as he gets ready to plunge the knife in, God says, wait, 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 wait. There's a lamb right there. Take that lamb let your son live because your son's going to be a living sacrifice. I'll provide the lamb. So Jesus dies for us so that we can become living sacrifices now we're talking about a spiritual kingdom here we're talking about the kingdom of god so we've taken the small picture of jesus and the lamb and god's going to expand this including that to us in the kingdom and after they celebrate the passover you know what the next thing it was they did they attacked jericho now let's see how they do that let me think let me remember the story you need to tell me this story. I can't remember the story. What did they do at Jericho? You don't remember it either. We're sunk. The singers and the preacher can't remember the story. No hope left. Didn't they walk around Jericho? Didn't they walk around Jericho for seven days? As a picture of prayer? And everybody up in Jericho is trembling. They don't know what they're doing. And they just, oh, it drives you crazy. They don't say anything. They just walk around it, walk around. It's a picture of prayer. And then on the last day, they blow the trumpets. Everybody shouts, and what happens to the walls? God did it. Jericho was the fort that kept them from getting to Jerusalem. God's going to tear it down. All right, now you got those two pictures? 
You got, you got Palm Sunday and you got triumphal entry and they're the same thing and they happen on the same day. You got that? Okay, let's go to point number three. The triumphal entry of the Christ of God. Now, we're going to read John 12, starting in John 12, 12. Now, watch this. Listen to this. This is cool. Well, wait. Before we do 12, 12, we've got to do verse 1. Now, you know the story. Jesus came to Mary and Martha and Lazarus' house six days before the Passover, right? Six days before the Passover. Y'all remember the story? Okay, now I'll read verse 12. The next day, so he's... He's there having a, a feast with Mary and Martha. And Mary takes the alabaster base and breaks it and pours perfume all over Jesus' feet while they're there and having this big feast for Jesus because Jesus has brought their brother back to life, Lazarus. Remember the story? Brought Lazarus back so they're going to pour oil over it. They're really happy to have Jesus there, and it's a big feast. They have it that night, six days before the Passover. Now, verse 12, the next day. Well, if it was six days before the Passover on the next day, how many days is it before the Passover? Five. Oh, my goodness. The same exact date. Five days before the Passover. On the tenth day of the first month, the Passover is always on the 14th. This is five days before the Passover. This is the tenth day of the first month. The exact same day. That was in Exodus. That was in Joshua. And now here it is with Jesus. Huh. That gets kind of interesting. Let's, let's read some more of it. When they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Would you show us that video? This is our same video we've been watching. Hang on. The Mount of Olives is a large, large mountain. Okay, would you go with me to, Matthew, uh, to Mark chapter 11, and we're going to read 1 through 11 as we, we read the triumphal entry, as we read Palm Sunday, Mark chapter 11. Now, when they drew near to J Jerusalem, to Bethphage, in English, anglicized Bethphage, but we'll call it Bethphage, and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, those two little villages are on the Mount of Olives. He sent two of his disciples, and he said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and as soon as you have entered it, you'll find a colt tied on which no one has sat. Loose him and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it, and immediately he'll send it here. So they went their way and found the colt tied by the door outside on the street, and they loosed it. Now, the interesting part of this story is God had the taxi running when Jesus got there. That is amazing. Some of those who stood by there said, What are you doing loosening the colt? And they spoke to them just as Jesus has commanded, and so they let him go. The Lord has need of it. Which Lord? Well, they knew. These guys are believers. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their clothes on the road, and others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Those who went before and those who followed. So they're coming out from Jerusalem to come to him. And the group's following him. And they're going to squish him in the middle there. And they're going to cry out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, it says they spread him out on the road. I personally don't think they put him down on the ground. I think they're holding these branches up across the top. And it said they took their clothes. Well, they didn't take their pants and their shirt off. They took their prayer shawls off, which are about 10 feet long, and they spread them across the road so that the sun wouldn't shine on the king. So they've got great big branches holding them up, and they've got their prayer shawls holding them across as Jesus rides under this thing for a quarter of a mile, and they're all yelling, Hosanna, God save us now, son of David, king. All right, let's read. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple. And when he looked around all things, as hours already laid, he went to Bethany with the twelve. But there's more to this story. 
Now we're going to read Luke 19, starting in verse 28. There's more to this story. When he said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass when he drew near to Bethphage and Bethla, at Bethany at the Mount called Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village opposite you, where you, as you enter you'll find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you loosing it? Thus you say to him, Because the Lord has need of it. To those who were sent, went their way, they, so those who went were sent their way just as it had been said to them. And as they were loosing the colt, the owner said to them, What are you doing? And they said, The Lord has need of it. Then they brought him to Jesus and threw their own clothes on the colt, and they set Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. Then as he was now drawing near the sin of the Mount of Olives, the whole, as he comes around the corner of the Mount of Olives on that road to the left, he sees Jerusalem. The whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he yells back. Now remember how loud it is. I tell you that these should keep silent. The stones would immediately cry out. Now as he drew near, he saw the city and he wept over it saying, if you had known, now he's going to talk about the salvation. If you had known, even you, especially in this day, the things that make for your peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side, and level you and your children to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. But there's more. Matthew chapter... Well, I don't have Matthew. Rats. Let me tell you what Matthew says. Matthew says there was a donkey and a colt. Which one did he ride? Would you put Zechariah 9-9 up there? Hold on. Don't go away. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. This is the prophecy of the triumphal entry of Jesus. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of, Beth of Jerusalem. Behold your king. Your what? Your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation. Lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt. The foal of a donkey. Matthew says that they took the donkey and put him on it until he got close to the gate, and then he got off and got on the foal and went into Jerusalem on the foal of the donkey. Now, what's going on here? Did the lamb die for our sins, or did the king die for our sins? Yes. Let me tell you what Matthew says. Matthew says he went into Jerusalem, he went to the temple, and he cleansed the temple, and then he went home to Bethany. He went into the temple, and he cleansed the temple, and then he went home to Bethany. Now, the word temple in the Hebrew is also the word palace. You can translate it either way. What is Jesus showing us at the triumphal entry? What is Jesus showing us about Palm Sunday? at the triumphal entry. Well, when you take those two stories in the Old Testament and you lay them on top of each other, Jesus is leading His church, His saved people, in this triumphal entry as they go through the gates of Jerusalem. He's leading us into the power of God just as it happened with Joshua and the river rolled back, he's leading us in the power of God to follow him into Jerusalem. And what does he do at the temple? At the temple, he cleanses the temple. 
He's given us the steps to revival for us. Not for Jerusalem. For the people following him. As we follow Jesus into this thing, as Jesus rolls back what's been holding us back from having the power of God in our lives, as he rolls back that, that obstacle, as he rolls back the flesh and the old man and teaches us how to walk in the Spirit of God, as we go into Jerusalem, he goes into the temple and he cleanses the temple. Just as he led the Israelites, as they were going in the Promised Land to cleanse themselves, he cleanses us. And here's what he said. My father's house is a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. In Luke, he said, you've made it an emporium. Give me a couple more minutes and I'll finish. Why have they made it a den of thieves? Because they turned the house of prayer into something that focused on money. They turned the house of prayer into something that focused on the physical. You've made it a den of thieves. You've made it an emporium. What's happened to the church today, what's happened to the United States today, is we've got our money on the physical, uh, we've got our eyes on the physical, and we've got our eyes on the money. Let me tell you about what happened in the United States today. We used to believe, give me liberty or give me death. Now we believe, give me money or give me death. What's happened to the United States of America as we've started focusing on finances instead of God? We started focusing on finances instead of virtues and values. We built this nation on virtues and values in God. We've turned it into money. But how did we get there? The nation always does what the church does. The church always does it first, and then the nation does the same. What has the church done? Well, according to Revelation, the last church, the church of Laodicea, God says, you are lukewarm. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ in this nation is lukewarm. Why? Because we say they were, we are rich and we have need of nothing. And God says, what my people are doing is focusing on the physical. They're focusing on the financial, and I need them to clean themselves up. I need them to purify themselves. How are we going to do that? Well, Jesus goes in, and he cleanses the temple, and he said, I want, I want you to get back to what? Prayer. I want you to get back to prayer. As they followed the Ark of the Covenant across the Jordan River, the Ark of the Covenant had inside of it the Bible, the Ten Commandments. God said, I want you to get back to the Ten Commandments. I want you to purify yourselves. I want you to purify your family. I want you to purify your church. I want you to purify your nation. I want you to get back to the Ten Commandments. I want you to get back to the, the Word of God. I want you to get back to prayer. And God is calling His church today as we get ready for Easter, as we get ready for the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God is calling His church today to cleanse themselves, to purify themselves, if you will, to circumcise your heart. And he takes the first picture, and he takes the second picture and overlays it. And the first picture is what he did for us. And the second picture is us following him. And as we do that, he gives us great, great power. The power of prayer with the Word of God. And when you put the Word of God and prayer together, you have unbelievably powerful prayers. The prayer of a righteous man, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And what we've got to do is we've got to get our eyes off of our physical. We've got to get our eyes off the financial. and We've got to get our eyes back on Jesus Christ. They followed Joshua across that river. Nobody was going across that river until Joshua stepped out there. Now the Ark of the Covenant got in the river and it rolled back. Brother, there wasn't one person crossing the river until Joshua stepped in there. Joshua's leading the army across. Jesus leads us across. We've got to get our eyes back on Christ. We've got to get our eyes. Okay, we're going to stop, but here's, here's the practical thing that we need to do. Every morning, 
We need to get up and spend time with Jesus and get our marching orders. Every day we need to spend time with God, just a little bit, not a whole lot. He doesn't require much. Reading the scriptures. Every day we need to spend a little bit of time in prayer and turn our homes, turn our hearts into the temple of God. Here's how Paul says it. What? Know ye not that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? God's already living in there. What we need to do is make sure our temple's cleansed. I've got to stop. Thank you for being so patient. Well, at least this side. <laughs> Would you bow with me, please? Oh, Lord, our God. Would you teach us about the resurrection? Lord, would you teach us about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, the Son of God? Would you teach us about our own kingdom in us? The kingdom of God is within us. Lord, you're within us. Would you help us to purify our hearts, follow you, and love you with all our hearts as we get ready this Easter season. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.